was 10 years old, uh, I went to a friend's house and uh, he invited me to ride bikes with him. I was like, cool, I'm an excellent bike rider. Had a BMX bike, anyone? Right? Just, I was ready to go. Shooting for the X Games, never made it, but it's okay. Um, so uh, he was like, let's ride bikes. He lives on this massive hill in La Jolla. And so I'm like, I hop on his bike and we start shooting down the hill. And all of a sudden I realize that um, the brakes don't work on his bike. And, um, and I immediately am aware, uh, gosh, yeah, probably 10, 12, maybe something like that. Um, I'm in massive trouble. And this hill is incredibly steep and it turns at the bottom. So I have no idea what's at the bottom. If it's an intersection, if it's a street, if it's a garage. But either way, I'm, I'm freaked out. So I have really two options at this point. I'm like, either I figure out what's at the bottom and hope for the best or I eject from the mountain bike and try and just clear it. And so I figured, I'm like, well, I think I have more control if I leave the bike. I'm, I'm thinking about this and I'm flying faster and faster down the hill. And so I, I'm watching like cows go by. And I, and I find one up ahead that has a big plot of grass. And as I approach it, I literally go, like, here you go. go just fly off the bike. Just like, oh man. And I'm like, this is good, I'm, I'm good. But then, without me knowing it, my pan got caught on the bike. So now, me and the bike are flying towards this grass, hit the grass, bike hits me, and I just go careening, just like, just literally, just like, you know like golf divots? It was like a Benji divot, just in their lawn. And um, bike all intertangled, and I'm just laying there, and I did what every growing boy into a man does, and I just didn't move. I just waited for someone to find the carnage of my body. Um, and no one came, including my friend. And I'm like, so after like five minutes, I'm like, this? All right, I should probably get up. So I get up, walk the bike to the top of the hill, and, and my friend's there, and he's like, where'd you go? I'm like, why did you give me a bike without brakes? And he's like, yeah, it has brakes. What are you talking about? And he reaches over and squeezes the handlebar. I'm like, oh, that's where the brakes are? Because I thought brakes you pedal backwards, like on my BMX bike. And it <laughs> turned, like, true, true story. Um, I'm, like, literally just marred, just bloody everywhere from this crazy trip. And the entire time, I had the tools and resources to stop this bike. But because I was familiar with a different type of bike, um, I ran into massive trouble. And the reason I tell you this story is tonight we're going to be talking about a familiar passage of Scripture. And whenever you approach Scripture that's familiar, there is this inherent danger that we can assume we already got it, already understand the message. Can we please move on to something more significant? Um, and I would like to just challenge that, that, that maybe this is not about finding new and unheard of scriptures. Maybe it's about going back to the scripture and saying, God, what else do you have for me here? What's a way I haven't looked at this before? Um, and I, I'm convinced this, this chapter has, has radically shifted in my understanding the more I've studied it, including this week. Um, and my hope is that as we look at this passage tonight, uh, that you would do the same thing. That you would not lean on what you know, but you press into what the Holy Spirit has for us. Uh, that he would want to speak to your heart. Not just information you would gain. I think sometimes, again, that's the temptation. Like, tell me something I don't know. And I hope I do. But more than that, God, what do you have for me? So, I'm going to go ahead and pray. Um, before I do, I'm going to go ahead and read our text tonight, which is Psalm 23. Um, and so would you just go ahead and just for a moment close your eyes. I'm going to read the text, and then we're just going to go ahead and pray afterwards. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters, and he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Jesus, we, we ask that tonight you would shepherd our hearts. Lord, that as you renovate our, our heart and our soul, that we would come into a clearer and more vivid understanding of you as our good shepherd. Lord, we need your guidance, your comfort, your provision. And that never changes. So Lord, we're asking for a new revelation, a new picture, a new experience of your shepherding of our heart tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, one of the reasons we're talking about Psalm 23 is we are in this series right now where we are trying to discover what does it mean to be with Jesus. Um, We are convinced that that is the foundation of our apprenticeship to Jesus, our discipleship to him. Uh, And if we don't know how to connect with Jesus, uh, then uh, we will fail in our ability to understand what it means to be with him. And so we are pressing into that, asking questions. And and I, I believe one of the greatest keys and insights that Jesus gives into how we connect with him is found in John chapter 10. When he says this, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who who is a hired hand is not a shepherd. He does not own the sheep. He sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Listen to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. It's a pretty explicit verse about being with Jesus, is our relation to him as shepherd and sheep. Now, we have to do a little bit of work tonight, which is why we're studying Psalm 23, because shepherding is an incredibly foreign concept to us. Uh, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. If you're a shepherd in the room, I apologize. You can leave. You, um, <laughs> tonight's not for you. You've got to figure it out. Uh, and for those of you who are not shepherding at the moment, Uh, hopefully we'll glean something from tonight. And in order for us to have a fresh look at Psalm 23, we have to do a little bit of contextual work uh, before we even enter the passage. And the reason because is when David writes this and why David writes this is incredibly important to us understanding the significance of this passage. Um, If you're like me, growing up and hearing Psalm 23, again, like all the time, it's in my grandma's house, like, You know, I'm sure there's like precious moments about it. I hear it at weddings. I hear it at funerals. I mean, it's it's, it's all the time. I hear it. And I imagine David like sitting in this like lush green field with like a couple sheep laying next to him. He has a harp, you know, and he's just like serenading the sheep. And he's like, the Lord is my shepherd, you know, and he's just like, it's kind of like he belongs in Encinitas, you know, just like, just that guy probably has dreadlocks. Just like, he just... Yeah, it's a really nice kind of sentimental passage. Um, But unanimously, scholars agree this is not when David wrote the psalm. David was not writing this when he was a shepherd. Um, And although it's not explicitly clear, most scholars would agree that this was written at a specific time in David's life. And this is after David had become king, risen to power, and the kingdom had exploded. Right, I mean, it is it is it's thriving and growing, and um, amazing political moves. And at some point, as the kingdom was flourishing, his family was falling apart. Um, so much so that uh, at this point in David's life, his son Absalom has led a coup against David and has taken over the majority of David's army and is now trying to kill his own father. And David's on the run. Not a good day for David. Um, life's not going great for him, right? I mean, everything he knows that he he loves and is familiar that he's built, he's poured his life into, is not only ripped from underneath him, but is now his own flesh and blood is chasing him down, trying to end his life. And as he's running from place to place and town to town, there is this moment, this kind of hidden story in 2 Samuel, where he's invited into the house of a shepherd, There's a shepherd named um, Barzillai. And Barzillai, um, we know from later texts, was about 80 years old and was kind of this head shepherd of this household. And when he arrives at the home of Barzillai, he knows who David is. He sees his men and he invites them in. This is where we're going to pick up our story. 
in 2 Samuel 17, verse 28. So Barzillai brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds, and sheep and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So, so imagine this, David on the run for his life with a few of his faithful men uh, are, are wandering through the wilderness where this shepherd happens to be, sees him and invites him in, says, let me take care of you. And he begins to feed him what seems to be a feast, right? I mean, he's not just like, here's some, some bread. I mean, like, he's laying out everything. So he lays out this feast for David and his men who maybe are on the brink of death, even from starvation. And he kind of revives him back to life. And at some point in this interaction, David finds time to reflect. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begins to start to pen, the Lord is my shepherd. I have nothing to be in want for. He'll make me lie down in green pastures. Lead me beside still water. Then he goes on and on and talks about this revelation he has that as this 80-year-old Palestinian shepherd has welcomed him in Yahweh, his God is doing the same, and he is caring for him. And so I would like for us to read Psalm 23 through that lens of, of not from a place of just this serene, tranquil, shepherd hippie boy, but from a place of desperation and anxiousness and uncertainty, and where does God meet us there? How is he our shepherd? Now, the good news for me is David breaks up this psalm into three literary pieces. And we're going to take a look at each three. And as a pastor, I love when things are broken up into threes. So um, thank you, David, for that. Uh, so three things we're going to be getting out of tonight's text. Number one is understanding that Jesus as our shepherd is that he is our guide to green pasture. He's the companion in deepest darkness and he's the host of redemption's table. This is the shepherd that Jesus uh, claims to be in John 10. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. And so let's start with this first one, that Jesus is our guide. He, as our good shepherd, he is our guide to green pasture. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, out of the gate, there's something really interesting about this passage that I, I don't want us to miss. And that is that David, like any Jewish person at that time and to this day, has an incredibly high, high view of God. And so much so that the name you prescribe to God really mattered. And David in this moment, talking about Yahweh, talking about his God, has this moment where he says, that God, the creator of the universe, the king of kings and lord of lords, is a shepherd. A blue collar, right, kind of in the soil, relationally intimate role. And beyond that, he doesn't even say he's the shepherd of Israel, which has been said before, but he actually goes a step further and says, he's my shepherd, which again, in, in, in kind of a, an Eastern culture, you don't really talk about yourself that much. You talk about your family, your people, but in this moment, I think it's my car. <laughs> Is it mine? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I love it. The reason I know that is because I sit on my keys all the time, so very cool. Yeah, I got you. Um, where am I? What am I doing? Hello. I, welcome to Light Church. Uh, <laughs> but he moves in this place where he's understanding that Yahweh is his Shepherd, it's incredibly personal, incredibly intimate. He's mine. He's leading me. He's guiding me. And then he goes and just talks about what a shepherd does. He leads me to green pastures and makes me lie down. Now, I want to tell you about a couple of trips I've made in the past few years. Not, not to brag, but I think it has some context. Uh, number one is to brag. I went to Ireland. 
uh, with Jen in, in, in Vienna, and it was as awesome as you would imagine, maybe even more. I mean, it is the most beautiful place. The green everywhere is unlike any green I've ever experienced, and there are sheep everywhere. And they are the happiest sheep you've ever seen, right? Like, they are just rolling around in the hills of just, like, enjoying the green. I mean, just gluttonous feasts. I mean, it's, it's just, like, the happiest place in the world to be a sheep, right? When they say happy cows come from California, happy sheep come from Ireland. Let me just tell you. And, and so this, this I'm, everywhere, I'm like, well, this is crazy. We're, we're seeing like real shepherds and real sheep. And so I'm like, we even went to a church called Green Pasture. I'm like, yeah, this kind of makes sense. And a couple years ago, though, I went to the Middle East, and I was on the border of Jordan and Israel. And our guide begins to tell us, telling me, is, um, many people believe that this is where David would have written the 23rd Psalm, on the run. And can, I just want to tell you something. There's no green anywhere. None. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean, lead me to green pastures, make me lie down in like dirt? Like there's just not, there's nothing around. There's like a couple bushes, but there's no green. And, and, and the reason why that's important is because in this territory, geographically, only a skilled shepherd could keep sheep alive. Because grass was not in abundance, You had to rely on a shepherd to get you to where you could not get to yourself. Now, that's that's huge for us because us understanding Jesus as our shepherd, listen to this, begins with the confession, I cannot find my own green pastures. Only you can. Jesus has to be the one who leads us into a place we cannot get to on our own. And this is so huge. And and I hope this jars you a little bit because we live in this cultural context where we spend so much energy and finances and time trying to create um, kind of synthetic green pastures. We, we try and make peace for ourselves. Oh, if, I, if I could just have a little bit more money, or if I had a promotion, or if I was, if I was with that person, or if, if I had just a little more time off, or, and we, we are always scraping, if I could just do this, have this, be with this person, this, then I would experience being able to lie down in green pastures. And in this moment, David, after a life of just fulfillment and, and success, confesses, I don't know where green pastures are. Only the shepherd does. You have to lead me there, and you have to make me lie down. This is fascinating, because you would think if you're a sheep in the Middle East, and you find some grass, you're immediately like, oh, thank God, I just need to go lay down, right? Just like, "Uh." but what's interesting is uh, sheep don't like to lay down. Uh, There is this really interesting book called A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23, by a guy named Philip Keller, who was an actual shepherd in the Middle East. And while looking at Psalm 23, he began to write kind of a commentary on it. Uh, As a shepherd in Palestine, this is what comes to his imagination. He has a really interesting observation about making sheep lie down. I just want to read you an excerpt from his book. He says, The strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it is almost impossible For them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. Uh, Let me read you these four requirements. Number one, owing to their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless they are free of all fear. Number two, because of social behavior within a flock, sheep will not lie down unless they are free from friction with others of their kind. Number three, if tormented by flies or parasites, sheep will not lie down. Only when free of these pests can they relax. Number four, lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel in need of finding food. They must be free from hunger. It is significant that to be at rest, there must be a definite sense of freedom. And from here they are, fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger. The unique aspects of this picture is that it is only the sheep man himself who can provide release from these anxieties. I love that line. It is only the shepherd who can provide relief from these anxieties. It all depends upon the diligence of the owner, whether or not his flock is free from these disturbing influences. So let, let's just for a moment, let's just walk down these four different things and let's apply them to our life. Jesus is our shepherd and we are to lie down in green pastures. 
Don't be fooled into thinking this is just some nice, cozy thing. It's another sermon about just resting up with Jesus. No, no, no. This takes work, but it takes work on Jesus' end more than on our end. So the, the number one thing that it mentions here is that we have to be free from fear. This is huge because sheep have no ability to fight other animals. You ever notice that? They got nothing. <laughs> They're kind of ridiculous. Like... God, like, kind of forgot to give them armor or horns or fangs or legs to run. I mean, they've got nothing, right? They're just absolutely pathetic and helpless. It's true, which is why I think God likes to refer to us as sheep all the time. It's just like, all throughout Scripture, you are like sheep, and we're like, man, like, yeah, I get it. This, it absolutely makes sense. And so the very first thing, a sheep will not lie down unless they feel free from fear because they know I can't lie down because if a wolf comes, if if someone comes, I have no way to defend myself. And so the fear a sheep has is completely connected to the, the, um, the distance of the shepherd. So the closer the shepherd is, the more safe the sheep feels. The only safety the sheep has to hold on to is the shepherd's nearness. Let's chew on that. And so when we talk about connecting with God and being with Jesus, know that there is something we have to understand of his nearness that allows us to finally just go, I don't need to control every little thing in my life. I don't need to... um, overthink and overanalyze every situation in my life. I don't need to lean into anxiety because Jesus is my shepherd. He's the one. And I love it. John, this is what John 10 says. He says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. So this isn't only that Jesus is near. It's that Jesus took the penalty away from us. He took it upon himself. If anyone's going down, Jesus says, it's going to be me. And it was. And so that's our first step in being able to lie down in green pastures. Number two is freedom from tension with other sheep. I love this. Um, I, the more we've, we've gotten into this church plant, we're, we're about a year old, uh, I have all sorts of conversations, um, and, I, and I just realize that people come into this place, and they're just like, oh, finally a perfect church. And I'm like, give me like three months. Like, it's all I need. Like, then the reason is because there's, there's people in this place. And, and no matter where we are, whatever church you go to, you will find people, and where you find people, you'll find a mess and hurt and pain that rubs up against your hurt and pain and insecurity. And, and what I love about this, uh, this text, this, this quote from Philip Keller says, it is up to the shepherd to relieve us from these anxieties. So if we let Jesus be our shepherd, he does, not, he does not just send one sheep fleeing over there and one sheep fleeing over there. He actually works with the sheep to live with each other. He brings them into this place. This is not easy to do. I'm, I'm sure there's been some shepherds with some bite marks on their fingers. Or they've tried to get sheep to kind of cohabitate together and be, and be with each other. But there, I believe in a spiritual sense, God is drawing his people. That's why I love what we're doing next week, just praying with other churches of other denominations and other backgrounds and other sizes for one thing. Because this is what Jesus, our shepherd, is doing. He's drawing us together. Third thing is he's providing freedom from aggravations. Um, This is one I think, I mean, just speaks directly to our cultural moment and our time that we're living in right now. And for sheep, it's, it's flies, it's pests, it's, it's a parasite, it's something kind of biting at them. Um, and, and for us, we have an iPhone, uh, we have email, uh, we have Netflix, I have four kids. Like, <laughs> there, there's just things that when you think about going and lying down in green pastures, things just happen. They just come at you, and you're just like, man, I... I want to do it, but there's so many things pulling at me in all different directions. I'll get to it tomorrow or next week. It's just a season. But if we pay close attention to the voice of our shepherd, he will lead us to a place and give us the wisdom we need of what does it look like to actually rest in his love. It doesn't mean these things magically disappear, but it means he can meet us in the midst of them and begin to create that space for us. 
Uh, and the fourth, fourth thing is pretty simple. Sheep won't lie down if they're hungry. And I love that in John's gospel, he does not only say, I am the shepherd, he also says, I am the bread of life. So not only is Jesus the one who's lying us down, but he's also the saying, he's also one saying, I'm enough. I'm just going to even just kind of stop right now, off script. I think that might just be a word for someone here tonight. Jesus is enough for you. He's the bread of life. The thing you've been craving will not satisfy you unless the thing you've been craving is Jesus. He's it. He's ultimately what our soul is desiring and longing for. Would you feast on him tonight, his presence, his goodness? And I think when we allow Jesus to become our shepherd, these things begin to fall into place. So that's, that's Jesus as our, as our shepherd, as our guide into green pastures. The second thing tonight is Jesus is our companion in our deepest darkness. So David's writing this down. I, I like to imagine him. He's late at night hiding somewhere in, in the property of the shepherd, and he's writing down this psalm, and, and he's talking about green pastures, and all of a sudden he makes this literary shift in the poem, and it's kind of subtle, and because we're so familiar with it, we miss it, but all of a sudden, you're not in green pastures anymore. Where are you? You're in Death Valley. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> green pastures, deepest darkness. <laughs> and, 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 and part of me thinks David's all over the place, which he continues to be in the rest of the poem. But part of me, if I think back to Jordan, it actually makes a lot of sense. If there's a green pastures, it's right next to a, a, a desert. It's right next to a dark valley. Um, those things uh, don't exist large, largely away from each other, but really next to each other. And so maybe in David's life, he's like, man, things were great. I was in a green pasture, and Jesus was making me lay down. And all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, how did I get here? You know what I'm talking about? You get that, that phone call. You get that, you have that conversation. Something happens where you're like, I was here, and how did I end up here? And what I love about how, how David is talking about the shepherd is he, stop, he stops talking about Yahweh as the shepherd, and he just starts referring to him as you. It's no longer this distant idea he's trying to describe. He's now talking about a very personal relationship. Listen, listen, listen to what he says. Even though I walk through the, deepest, or through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me right now. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And, and I love this illustration that, that David's providing for us as Jesus, our shepherd, because um, if I'm putting myself in the role of a shepherd, which, again, as a pastor, I don't know if you knew this, the word shepherd and pastor in the Greek are synonymous, they're the same word. Um, so if you ever want to call me Pastor Benji, Shepherd Benji will do just fine, um, biblically speaking. Um, Shep. Either one. Uh, so, but we, or bishop, I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> but my, my, my knee-jerk reaction when I talk to people who are in their, their dark valley, right, the, the best Hebrew translation is the deepest darkness, my, my immediate thing is like, okay, how do I give them a plan? How can I tell them it's going to be okay? How can I tell them, hey, man, two more weeks, God's going to break through, let's pray. And immediately I'm just trying to think like, we got this. Here's how. If you do this, read these books, do this devotion, come to church, do these things. And then it's going to be it's because I, I want to help. I want to provide a plan. I want to give them something tangible. But when, when David's writing about the shepherd, he doesn't give us any of that thing. He doesn't give us a plan. He just gives us his presence. That's what he gives us. He's with me. This is for, from a man who's literally running, from his, for, running for his life. He's fearing that he might not even wake up tomorrow. And in this, he, just, he doesn't write about God's plan of, of exodus. He doesn't write about this massive deliverance or breakthrough. He just says that he's, Lord, you're with me. I don't have anything to fear. Your rod and your staff, they bring me comfort. It's your presence that I desperately need. And I have to remember that, as, whether it's my kids, my wife, the people that I'm ministering to, that I so badly want to give them a plan, but really, ultimately, our deepest desire of our soul is to know the presence of God. 
And sometimes we feel it, and this is the thing I want you to get. Sometimes you will feel it, and sometimes you won't, but it's always there. It's always there. I love that Jesus exemplifies this. After the next chapter of John 10, we find the story of Jesus showing up to meet his friend Lazarus, who's sick, and he's already died. He's been dead for two days. And he meets Mary and Martha, and Mary comes up to him just weeping and saying, if you would have been here, then my brother wouldn't have died. And can I tell you something? She's absolutely right. If Jesus would have been here, that wouldn't have happened. Ever have that conversation? God, where were you? If you would have just showed up right now. And again, if I'm Jesus in that moment, I would have just been like, shh, five minutes. I'm going to blow your mind. I got you. Right? Shock and awe. coming your way. Just, I'm like, just don't even cry. I got this. Jesus doesn't do that. I think one of the most peculiar things we, I see Jesus do in the gospel in that moment before he heals him, which meant it could have happened five minutes later. He says he just weeps with her. Why would Jesus weep with someone, enter into their pain, when he's about to take their pain away? Because he's a shepherd. And shepherds don't stand on top of the valley looking down, giving direction. They walk with the sheep. They're with them in the darkness. He provides the presence with them. And if you're here tonight and you're in a valley of deepest darkness, I, I wish I could give you the plan. I wish I could give you the time frame. I wish I could give you the, uh, the solution. But all I can promise you is presence. You're not alone. And in that you can find comfort. I, I remember being in the Dominican Republic um, a few years back with some of our interns at the time. And uh, Carlos, who's the director of Plant With Purpose, his ministry in the DR, took us on a trip um, on our day off to go hike into these caves. Um, and it's as sketchy as it sounds. So we're, we're going into this cave, and it's getting darker and darker and darker. And, and, I, and I have like about 10 interns at the time. And I'm like, okay, I, ha- like, I have to remember how to get back. Um, I'm just dropping like little like breadcrumbs as I'm like going. Um, and all of a sudden we get so deep into the cave, all we have is flashlights, you can't see anything. And he starts showing us these, these carvings on the wall of these like pagan sacrifices that they would do. And it's just like eerie. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Why, why are you taking us here? And then he goes, turn, turn off the lights. I'm like, what? No. I'm going to turn off the lights. And so... And so we, we turn off all the lanterns, and, and I, I kid you not, it was the darkest experience I had ever had in my entire life. I mean, you could, I could not see my hand. Like, there was, I've never been in that type of darkness in my life. I, I was, it was kind of overwhelming. And I'm like, okay, we don't know. Like, and and in, 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 in that moment, I completely forgot about trying to find my way back, and I just grabbed Carlos's arm. I was like, Poof. I'm like, just stay close, Carlos. I don't go anywhere. And he goes, ha, ha, ha. He just kind of laughs. And then he's like, let's, let's sing to the Lord. And I'm like, okay. And we started singing worship songs in, this, in, the, in the darkest place I'd ever been in my life. And I, I just want to tell you something maybe one of my most memorable worship experiences of my life. The presence of the Lord in that dark, lost place was so real. Whenever I read that, I think about the, this, or whenever I read this passage, I think about that moment, I think, about, Jesus, thank you. You're everywhere. You're everywhere. You're never not with us in these moments. Last thing, you know, we learn from this passage is that Jesus is the host of redemption's table. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now because of time's sake, we won't be able to get to the, all of this passage, but I want to just give you a few, few notes on the beginning of this. Number one, David makes another literary shift. He goes from green pastures, deep dark valley, 
table. Like, he's kind of all over the place in this poem. But when he gets to the table, all of a sudden, this person is present again. This shepherd is present again, but he's not just leading and guiding. He's not just present. He's now hosting a dinner. And this, and in Yahweh God, Jesus ultimately, in, in this moment, begins to say, prepare a table for me. This word prepare in the Greek is this ongoing verb, meaning he doesn't stop preparing. Isn't that interesting? It's this ongoing posture of his heart. There is this meal, and in this moment, there is this ongoing sense of service. And, and I, when, I, when I think about it like that, like God is serving me, I feel as uncomfortable as Peter did when Jesus tries to wash his feet, right? He says, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says what? It's like, I have to. Otherwise, you have no part of me. Have you ever been to a friend's house where they're making dinner and you brought like the salad or something and you get there and there's still work to do? And, you're like, and what do you say? What can, I, what can I do to help? Right? And most people say, nothing, go sit down. Unless you mean Jen, we're like, please do the dishes. Um, <laughs> you know, change Augustine or whatever. Like, we'll take all the help we can get at our house. Um, everyone's like, I don't want to go there. Um, <laughs> good, invite us to your house. That'll be much better. Anyways. Um, but, but normally, uh, but you, I imagine myself at this table that God is preparing for me, and my knee-jerk reaction is going to be, how do I help, which is, which is religion. How do I contribute to this table? And Jesus politely looks at me and says, you have nothing to add. I've prepared all of it for you. Everything that you need is here. I think about David in the wilderness, not eating for days, ending, uh, ending up at this table of a shepherd and feasting, and he provided nothing. And months before, he was the king of Israel. There's not a single person in the world that will not come before Jesus, no matter how influential, successful, powerful they may be here, that when they stand in the presence of God, we can bring nothing. And it's in that moment, are you willing to receive grace, what Jesus has brought for you? Which sounds like an obvious yes, but let's be honest, it is uncomfortable to receive grace. It's something that we have to continue to lay down our pride in order to do to receive this kind of mercy, to receive this. But what I love about this is it gets even better because it's not just about Yahweh being our host, Jesus hosting this feast for us as our shepherd, but then he starts talking about who's present, who's the audience at this table, and it's our enemies. And, and what's happening right here is David is describing a very familiar militaristic theme that you see all throughout the ancient world, where one power would overtake another power, overthrow another city, and what they would do is they would chain up their highest-ranking officials, and they would um, plaster them around the wall, um, powerless with nothing, oftentimes just stripped bare, and they would be chained up, and they would have to watch the victorious king and his men eat their spoils. And so David, on the run, I can just imagine him being like, Lord, you're my shepherd. You're going to lead me to a place where I can lie down again. You're with me in the deepest valley. You're preparing a table like this for me. And one day, the enemies who are after me or chasing me down or I can't get rid of, someday they will be rendered powerless and I will feast with you. And, and, and I love David's humanity. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's like imagining Absalom in that moment, like, just because of the rawness of the Psalms. Like David doesn't hold back. But I love that Paul, in his letter to the Ephesian church, gives us an insight, I think, deeper into what's actually happening here, which again alludes to this idea of heaven that our enemies are not against flesh and blood. So before you start imagining your boss you don't like being chained up against a wall, like, I like this sermon. This is good, you know? Or whoever that person is, our, look at our, our fight is not against flesh and blood. But I will tell you, there are enemies of our soul 
There are principal, principalities and powers of the air. There are forces of evil who are planning our demise that one day, listen, one day will be rendered powerless. I believe Psalm 23 is not just a hopeful song for a king in his old age. I believe it's a prophetic picture of Jesus as our shepherd and the supper of the lamb we can long for now. I think about the enemies who will be chained up at that meal. I think about Sin chained up. I think about fear chained up. I think about depression chained up and anxiety chained up and abuse chained up. I think about cancer chained up. I think about death itself and Satan himself rendered powerless, looking on as we feast on the grace and mercy of God. He purchased for us at the cross that every single one of us can long for and we can have a foretaste now, even as we share communion together, that what has been purchased for us at the cross is the assurance that someday there will be a different meal than the one that's been handed to you in this life. And it's redemption's table. And he's our good shepherd. And he knows us and we can know his voice. And there will be a time when we'll come to a table we can bring nothing to, but we will feast on the abundance of God's love. And everything that has haunted you in this life will be powerless. I'm going to invite Will to come up. And as he does, I'm going to invite you just to close your eyes. And I'm going to read um, another portion of a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome. And he makes reference to us being sheep. He makes reference to the enemies of our soul that would try and separate us from this table, that would separate us from the presence of God. And as you sit there and close your eyes, I want these words to seep in just to, the, to the, the assurance of the promise of what Jesus has done. And then we're, we're going to break bread together. We're going to come to the table, and we're going to not only remember what was, but we're going to have a foretaste of what's to come. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And listen to this list. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And Paul just writing, is anything going to separate us from the love of God? No matter how bad it gets, we're like sheep being led to the slaughter. But then I love the next verse in verse 37. It says, no. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you so much that we have a good shepherd. Lord, that every single enemy of our soul, Lord, every single season that is deep and dark, Lord, every single time it is hard to rest in you, we serve a good shepherd. 
Lord, thank you that you have promised to be with us. You have promised to lead us. And you have promised to invite us to redemption's table. You have promised to invite us to a meal we cannot add to, but we can sit and feast on. Lord, thank you that every single enemy that we just listed, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, death, The life in this world, demons, rulers, our past, our future, powers, height and depth, and even death itself can not win. Lord, thank you that love has conquered them all. So we stand here tonight and we cry out, Jesus, be our shepherd. Shepherd our souls. Lead us to green pastures. Make us lie down. Be with us in our deepest darkness. And would we hold on to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the victory that has been purchased at the cross. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.